Hi there. You know, there is literally a whole world that exists under your feet. Did you know that? A whole world right under your feet? Well, you wouldn't want this under your feet or that since it's venomous, but close-ups, macro photography, that's what we're talking about today. This is the little things in life, right? Little invertebrates, insects, tiny plants. When you get really close to them and look at them, they are as alien as if from outer space, especially the insects. Very amazing. In this lecture, we're going to discuss macro photography. And this is a subject that's very otherworldly indeed. You know, it may be that the eye is the window to the soul, even if that eye is wearing contact lenses. But it's good macro photography that gets us there in the first place, isn't it? It's a window or a portal to this normally unseen place. If that sounds exciting, it's because it is, really. I want to show you some of the gear that I use for macro work. Now, let me say first off, first and foremost, there are literally a thousand macro photography rigs out there, often customized, and what you see here won't be around forever. Technology changes constantly. It's a good thing this isn't really a technical course or an equipment course. I don't want you to be too consumed with the gear. This is about seeing well and thinking things through. So what you see here is just what I use, and I don't use all of this stuff consistently. It's whatever I feel like. This just gives you an idea of the things that I use before you go out and form your own style of trying this. So let's take a look at what I have. There's a wide variety here, and most people would say, oh gee, you know, I want to be a really good macro photographer. I'm going to get the best thing I can find. I'm going to get this wireless flash system and an autofocus TTL lens on a new body. I'm going to do this. Well, that's fine, you could do that, I guess, but you know, a lot of times, I don't use something like that. I'll use a little ring light, goes over the end of my lens, illuminates subjects, small subjects, very well. Uh, I will use little extension tubes, look at that, there's no glass in this. It is simply a hollow ring that gets the lens away from the body, so I can zoom in a little bit more, even though I'm using macro lenses. Or you know what, if I'm lazy, or even if I'm not, I'm on vacation, I'll use this, it's a little point and shoot, it's got a macro setting on it that's very, very nice. Love it, it's just fine. So what do I use a lot? Well, tell you the truth, I use this. I'll use a tripod with a macro lens in soft light. I will introduce light also to get lots of depth of field. I will introduce light by using something like this, a little soft box, or if I wanna travel extra light, I'll use a little light dome on my flash, just like this. It's kinda of nice. It's just translucent like a milk carton, take it, put it on there, mount it up, turn it on, that's it. A tripod and a cable release, I use these all the time, all the time. I hold the flash up here, fire away, it looks good. If I want the light even softer, the softer, softer light comes from a closer light. The closer the light is, the softer it is. So I'm just gonna work like this, that's it a tripod and a cable release. A lot of times I won't even use a flash. It just depends on my mood and what I want to do. It's that simple, it really is. It's not too complicated. I like to keep things simple. Soft light, tripod, cable release, subject's not moving, no reason not to, lots of depth of field, away we go. So one last point, flowers are easy. It helps to have an autofocus macro lens if your subjects are likely to move, like insects, for example, or little frogs or something. This is because even for somebody like me who does this stuff for a living, when you're working really close up, it's nearly impossible to follow focus with a macro on something that's moving about quickly. Insects that are moving really, really are tough to get in focus without an autofocus lens. So now that we've talked about the physical equipment, and you notice how light we are on that talk, well, it's because I want you to think and see well, that's why. What else are we going to talk about? Guess what, guys? We're going to talk about the same rules we've been talking about all through this course. They apply to macro photography as well. Lighting, composition, and something interesting, please. I expect the same high standards. It's just that close-ups in nature, well, it's a little more challenging. But it's more interesting in a way, too. Let's look at a couple of pictures that really start us off with what macro photography is about a very shallow depth of field. As you get closer, you get less and less in focus. Look at that, that's just a macro lens out of the box on another venomous snake, but it's very, very, it's very, very shallow depth of field. Why is that? 
Well, I think of a macro lens as a telephoto lens in miniature for two reasons. You've got a shallow depth of field when you're in very close, and also the image is very prone to camera shake and movement because you're magnifying things so much. You're really zooming in. It's a telephoto in miniature. These are both things to be careful of. Now, we know that we can eliminate camera shake with a tripod if the subject is sitting still, just like I showed you back there. So let's try that first on something very easy, flowers. Why? Because they're pretty and they're not running away from us. I use flowers all the time. I enjoy flower photography. Nothing wrong with that. So flowers are three-dimensional, aren't they? They don't occur on a single plane. Most of them are rounded. Not everything's going to be sharp, therefore, if you have a very shallow depth of field. Some may curse that a bit because it makes it harder to pick a spot to focus on. I think this can offer some advantage. It blurs out the backgrounds, even when I'm a little farther back, right? When you're blurring out the background, you really help bring your subject forward and soften everything up. Okay, so let's look at a couple of these. Look, I'm getting in closer, less depth of field, a lot less depth of field here. How is this done? Just like I'm showing you in here. That's it. Flowers on a tabletop with a macro lens on a tripod with a cable release with window light. That's it. All right, let's look at three more here. Here we go. Now, if you're starting away from the subject a little bit, like I did, I'm pulled back here. You don't really need a lot of depth of field again because you've got a good idea that this is a bouquet, don't you? But as you get closer, look what happens. As you get closer and you're still focused on your prime subject there, your target, the other flowers get softer and softer. Pretty soon we just have a hint of color back there, a suggestion that other flowers are back there, but they're not at all sharp. And that's fine. That's okay to do it that way. Now remember, the closer you get to the subject, the less depth of field you're going to have. I'm going to say that over and over again, but it's very true. The farther away you get from your subject in macro, the more depth of field you get. Okay? That's, that's just how it is. But getting closer is the point. We want to be close. That's what macro is. So that means you're going to need to learn to maximize your depth of field if you want to go beyond the easy stuff, the shallow stuff. So, how do we correct for this very shallow depth of field that's inherent in macro photography? We get a lot of light in there and crank down that aperture to a very small hole, that's how. We gather light how? With long exposures on something that's not moving, using a tripod and a cable release, okay, that's easy. Or, we add artificial light. We throw light in there with a flash, something like a flash to really make it sing. We'll talk more about adding flash in a minute, but let's really talk about using natural light well. If the subject's not moving, I get that tripod down and dirty. I get that in there, I move that lens around, and I really look at the subject and study it. My goal is to get as many good pictures of, say, a Gerber daisy as I can get. That's how it works, all right? With a tripod, really, you can do some amazing things on subjects that aren't going anywhere. You can get incredibly high apertures, moving beyond even, say, f22 to 36. One of my macro lenses goes to f45, and that's incredible. Does that mean everything's tack sharp? Sometimes, yeah. Depending on how close you are and how far back you want to throw that focus, sometimes not, but it'll get you most of the way. F22, F36, F45, that's good stuff. They're, it's very, very three-dimensional that way. Now, if I'm trying to work outside, that's tough. If it's a little windy out and you're trying to do flowers that would normally be stock still indoors, I work outside all the time. Try to bring something with me to keep things from moving in the wind. It could be anything from a cardboard box to one of my portable shooting tents that allows light to filter in from all sides. So we get closer. This was a very windy day, actually. Flowers are tack sharp. Okay. So again, let me stress that when you need to get close to a subject that's not running away from you, you really need to have that camera on a tripod if you want a tiny hole in the lens because you're going to call for a longer exposure than you can hold still. Steadying the camera is really, really important with macro, critically important. Just as it is with a larger, heavier lens like a 600 millimeter telephoto, you'd need help. You'd want a tripod or a monopod, okay? Don't forget that in that soft, weak light with the smallest hole in the lens, you're going to have to use that cable release. You are. It's a, it's a little bit of a pain, but you have to use it so that you don't jiggle the camera when you press the shutter. With a macro, even the slightest movement will throw your subject wildly out of focus. The whole world will be a blurry mess. That's just how it is. Steady the camera, steady the subject when you're working on a tripod with slow shutter speeds. Very important, okay? So I often like to increase the, the aperture and work the light. So sum up, 
as a very general rule in macro, and there's a million ways to do this, this is my way of doing it, the biggest challenge is to get all the depth of field. I can, if I'm not working on a tripod, it means I'm gonna to wanna to pump some light on the situation and increase the aperture, which will give us more of the frame in focus. Besides using a tripod, how else to get that aperture constricted? I've done it a number of ways. I'll show you a couple here. I've used a flashlight on amphibians, for example, to really pump light in and get things sharp because the, the animal's breathing, moving a little bit. We get a fast enough shutter speed that way. Then there's reflected sunlight. That's a lovely light source for macro photos. One very simple way to do this is just, uh, and the way I started out, is to shade the subject on a sunny day, shade the subject, just my own shadow or friends, and then use a reflector to kick supplemental light onto the subject. You can use anything. You can use a store-bought reflector. You could use a piece of colored paper. You could use a t-shirt that's bright or maybe a t-shirt that's got some orange or some yellow to it. Pretty easy and pretty nice. For, for, uh, personally, I'm partial to a gold reflector. If the sun's out, I'll find a flower, shade it, and then kick in this soft, warm, beautiful, glowy, reflected light. It is gold. It looks like firelight in the middle of the day. You've shaded your subject, and now you're kicking in this wonderful reflected light straight off the sun, let's say off a gold reflector or a gold t-shirt or anything like that. Oh, man, I love that. It's one of the very best looks. Very subtle and yet effective. Very nice. A couple of pictures here with the camera stopped down as much as I can, with the lens stopped down as much as I can, tiniest hole in the lens I can get. These are actually tiny ground-hugging flowers about this tall, maybe not even a half inch tall, out in the middle of the desert in Nevada. It's in the middle of the summer at high noon. The light outdoors couldn't have been any worse, but you would never know it to look. That's just shaded, and now with the gold reflector kicking in. Wow, tiny hole in the lens, camera's on a tripod, I am using a cable release, it is not a windy day, and voila, there we go. Just a lovely, lovely light source there, reflected light. But of course, what would a macro lecture be without talking about flash? We must talk about flash. Yes, Flash is our friend, and we can use it, and it's nothing to be scared of. I use Flash all the time in macro. just depends on my mood and whether the subject's moving. Truly, a Flash is the fastest and most reliable way to add lots of light to our macro shots. Plus, it freezes action, doesn't it? A must when photographing small critters or things that are moving around on you. My favorite Flash technique by far is to use a little handheld softbox like I had on the table there. Don't let how that thing looks fool you, by the way. It's small but mighty. It allows me to use a smaller hole in the lens and greatly increase the depth of field. And that's what we're all about if we're trying to give a lot of information about little critters that I photograph. It also gives off a quality of light that is really fabulous. If you look at this, this is with that little handheld soft box, but you could, you could do this with a Kleenex over the end of your lens too. Just anything to diffuse the light a little bit. As is always the case with flash, the closer the light is to your subject, the softer it will be. It's a bit counterintuitive, but that's how it is. So I try to get that flash or the diffuser covering it right up close and, and basically drool as I watch that flash wrap around my subject. Macro flash is a fantastic place to really see how elegant electronic flash is when really used well. Can you believe it? That's just a ladybug in my backyard. Can you believe that? It's just using flash well. Nice and close. That's the beauty of macro photography. You could spend a lifetime in your backyard. You totally could. Now, if you don't want to use a softbox, you can do it on the cheap and use a little bounce card, simply like an index card, or anything really bounce off your shirt. Anything light that the light will bounce off of and onto your subject, that's fine. The other way you can use flash, for example, in insects anyway, is with a ring light. As I'd mentioned, a ring light just gets just puts a light right around the tip of the lens there. And it's a nice feature because sometimes your lens is so close to the subject, it literally shades the subject from any light. So that's trouble. You need to use a, a ring light or a light right at the tip of the lens. That's just how it goes. It's mounted right on the front. It's a handy invention, very handy. I'd recommend it if you're doing something where you're really, really, really close, such as this. This is a, a water boatman, a little insect. He's, he has this iridescent sheen on him. And you do get a little bit of a reflection because he's got a hard shell that makes him shiny. But that's okay. It makes great pictures in an otherwise kind of impossible situation where your lens is right on top of the subject, so close that your softbox wouldn't be able to really light him fully. A ring light's very helpful there. One thing I really like to do is have the light come at the subject at more of an angle. Just like if I was shooting a big scene, macro's no different. 
right? You get more shadows that way, which gives you more dimension and depth to your pictures. So let's look at some of the animals I've photographed using macro lenses and using flash with the camera. As with flowers, I'm hoping for a lot of depth of field here, but because the subject is moving some, I really like to use flash to freeze the action a bit. Otherwise, it'd be pretty tough. So here I'm using an inexpensive uh, studio lighting kit, one I got at a garage sale actually, my first one anyway, and I'm still using pieces of it. This is a, a crocodilian down in Florida. It's a slender snouted crocodile. The kit that I have consists of a power pack right there and several of these flash heads that have bigger soft boxes on them, right? And you mount those to little light stands. It's a little kit that packs in a suitcase very easily. Again, the closer to your subject, the softer the light is. And I can use this studio lighting set for bigger things and macro work. So it's just a matter of having enough light. It doesn't matter what the vehicle, the delivery vehicle for the light is. It's just a matter of having enough light to get you plenty of depth of field to really work it. And again, getting the flash off the camera and having those flashes come at different directions really models, really sculpts the light. Very, very nice. You know, I've been photographing a lot of plants and animals using that studio softbox set. The results are, are wonderful and surprising. I mean, if you think about it, think of how this stuff would normally look in the wild. They've been hidden down in the brush. You can't really see them. They're in the mud or the sticks. They're, there's all sorts of debris and distractions around them. They'd be in heavy shade. I like to use these backgrounds to really clean them up. Black and white backgrounds really brings out their essence. I don't know if that turtle's happy or not, but he sure got a smile on his face, right? It works great for plants as well. Again, it's not really how you deliver the light, it's how you capture it in this case. Little snails the size of a pencil eraser even. They look great on white backgrounds, they really do. So by adding this type of light source and making things beautiful, you take something that's normally overlooked, these tiny little things, and you make them ordinary, extraordinary really, like a ladybug, man, how can you make a ladybug look good? Macro and getting the light off to the side, that's it. You're lighting this stuff in such a beautiful way that your viewers won't be able to help but see how great these things are. They'll fall in love with these creatures. They absolutely will not be able to help themselves. They'll ooh and ah every time, I guarantee it. For example, let's take toads. What can you do with a toad? I don't know. Toads are often maligned. I think they're kind of beautiful and they're very cool. When you put light on them and you shoot them with a macro lens, wow, they're interesting. They really are. There's a lot of texture, worms I view shooting through glass from underneath, get them hopping away or just facing away, right? Look at what you can do with a macro and just some additional light. You almost don't even need to, to worry about anything else than just zoom in. You don't even need a background in a way when you're that close to his eye. It's wonderful and it's not anything that's that complicated. It's just adding a lot of light and being in focus and hoping they hold still long enough. Another tip. Do the unexpected. Everybody thinks about flowers and insects when they think about macro, but you can and should go beyond that. I do that all the time. How about the eye, the human eye? You know somebody that's got a great eye? I'm sure you do. Somebody in your own home? Maybe one of your kids, your spouse, whatever? I shoot, I shoot eyes all the time. I don't shoot the whole face, just part of an eye. It's fascinating, it's amazing. Have you ever gotten close to it and seen how a pupil constricts and the eyelashes and the color and the veins? The eye is an amazing thing, just amazing. If you get in close with a macro, you'd be fascinated at how it looks from that point of view, that perspective. And this is something that you're looking at all your life, many times a day in a mirror. How about that? The human eye, it's nice. Don't forget to photograph non-human eyes as well, which are even more amazing. You ever looked at a cat eye up close? Or how about an alligator eye up close? Well. You can do this stuff. It's just a baby alligator, but he doesn't look it. He looks enormous, right? Same with good teeth, believe it or not. Teeth pictures. My assistant, Grace, she's obviously taken good care of her teeth over the years. Get very, very close once in a while. Just very, very close on her mouth. It's very interesting. It's fun, at least for me. I don't know if Grace likes it or not, but she puts up with it. So the things people have to put up at my, with my house, it's, it's not good, but you know they all get paid, so it's all right. So let's look at things you can do with macro, just around the office, for example. It's not just living things you can do, you can do inanimate objects, can't you? Jewelry is a classic place to do things like this. If you've done close-ups of jewelry, have you ever looked at a diamond this way? Have you ever looked at one in the mount? Have you ever seen an up-close of how a diamond is kept in place 
so that you don't lose it. I bet that'd be a nice shot to try sometime. Or you could do other rings, maybe just a tight shot of somebody's hands with a macro lens. You can actually back up. You don't have to be super close all the time. So what else? Well, it's often fun to use a macro lens on money. Detail shots reveal that our currency is actually beautiful, works of art. Totally. Closer, closer, closer. Wow. You never stop and look at these things. The bottom line is that, that anything like this, if you go in tiny and close, common things, you cannot believe how you can reveal these things in a very intimate way, in a new and surprising way that's worth thinking about, going after it with a macro lens. It's totally worth your time. Now, again, it's not like this is genius or anything. It's just that we're talking about taking the time to craft the light well and to think and to use a macro lens effectively. And this just comes with practice. That's it. Now, one other thing with macro, this is where we get the little racehorse effect. We really, really want to zoom in close, really close. We use the extension tube I mentioned over at the table. It's just a simple ring of metal that extends your macro lens away from your camera body a little bit and zooms in a little bit more. Look at the eye on this gecko, holy cow. Or even just his feet. Amazing, just amazing. Now these are just little reptiles you'd buy at a, at a pet shop, right? The amazing detail you can see there. It's like you're on another planet. The best part is geckos don't move very much or chameleons, they hold fairly still. They like to sit still all the time. So you could do this with anything in theory if you could find something that would sit still long enough. In macro work, holding relatively still, both on your end and your subjects, is fairly important because there's so little focus depth if you're only using ambient light. Now let's look at something that I shot handheld using shade, flash, and reflector. Uh, we got a box of chocolates at our house, and before I ate all of them, oh, well, maybe I shared a little bit, I decided, well, I'm gonna work a wide range of things here because I really wanna see, uh, I wanna see what I can do. Now look, the top of these chocolates, the top, they're all in the same focal plane. So great, we can use a shallow depth of field for one. They're all in the same focal plane for this initial shot. This is just basically standard light, nothing to it. That's what the light looked like. There we go, mid-morning sunlight, the sun comes out, a little bit more harsh. Look at how we've lost the shadow detail there. No shadow detail at all, very harsh. We're exposing for the highlights so we're not blowing out or losing data there, but very harsh shadows, not that pleasing. Now let's see what else we can do. Okay, there's little Spencer, he's shading it. He's shading the box with my soft box. That's all we're doing is shading it right now. Okay, mid-morning sunlight and shaded. Now we're starting to get some shadow detail in there. Much better. We're not blowing out the highlights. We've exposed for the bright parts and we do have shadow detail. So just shading, that's a lot better than just harsh sun. It's probably 9, 30, 10 in the morning. Now we're actually gonna light with that soft box. Check this out. Mid-morning sunlight, shaded with the soft box and throwing a little flash in there. And we've got a little bit more detail. That works too, but you know my favorite? It's the easiest. My favorite's actually the easiest. There's Grace holding that big gold reflector and Spencer is shading those chocolates. So we've got shade and reflected sun. Look at that beautiful, warm, glowy. Love that. That's my favorite look of all and I didn't need any expensive setup to do this. Handheld, not very much depth of field because all the chocolates were focusing on the tops of the chocolates. The simplest lighting system of all and that's the best? Yes. You don't need expensive gear. You can do this just by thinking your way through this. Honest. So one reason I really like using a flash and a softbox is it gives me a certain look. Lots more depth of field. When I need depth of field, I'll throw flash in there all the time if something's moving, right? Because it freezes action. I can move freely if my subject's hopping around. In the case of the candy, we wouldn't want to eat them if we were moving, of course. But no matter the technique, in macro, I'm looking for the same thing as always something interesting, always something interesting, composed well, nicely lit. And sometimes I will purposely use F2.8 just to see how that very shallow depth of field looks. I like that. Like for example, this tiger's eye shot at a zoo. I use a very shallow depth sometimes and it's a nice effect. Nothing wrong with it. In fact, I like it better than if I had a lot of depth of field. I do that all the time. You wanna know something I try to never do though in macro photography? Harsh light. Really bright direct sun. Man, the shadows just kill you. This may look like an okay picture to you, but I don't care for it. I mean, I've got a lot of shadow in there, and that really, really hurts, I think. I really try to think about that. 
It's easy to shade a subject when you're talking about macro because the area you're concentrating on is very small. Just have somebody stand next to you. They can shade the subject. So see the difference here? We've got soft light now. That's where it's at for me most of the time, soft light. All we did is move those flowers out of the sun and we can move around on them. That's all, that's it. So speaking of soft light, it is very hard to beat ambient light. Are you picking that up? Are you with me now? And so I'm, I'm often tempted to shoot only available light because it works so well some of the times and it has a certain look to it. Depending on my mood, that's just fine. I want you to look at a couple pairs of pictures here. The first I shot using just available light and the second using flash. There are subtle differences, but see now you've got a discerning taste and you're gonna know what you're looking at. So let's look at a pair here. This is a little bit noisy. It's in a dark room. Again, one of my favorite subjects, toads. Very little depth of field. The skin on the eye is sharp, but the skin on his body is soft. That's how little the depth of field is. I bet we don't have an eighth of an inch depth of field, maybe a quarter of an inch. Certainly the, the leg and the hand holding him aren't sharp. Now we'll look at the same species with light, okay? With flash. Look at this, every detail is sharp. And you know, sometimes I prefer this look. Whenever I can get it, if I take the time to get the softbox out, really nice and sharp, very professionally lit. The light's off to the side. You can see the highlight in the eye there. We're holding the light off the side and we're really lighting him well. And that's nice, okay? Another pair, same thing here. This was shot actually just last week. This is a little sparrow. This is using a wide open aperture, just ambient light, that's it. It's a little dull, a little flat. This is inside my shooting tent. Not a whole lot of depth of field, but it's a nice, soft, kind of a down mood, but it's okay. Now look at the second one. Using flash, much more vibrant, much more lively, and lots and lots of detail there. The second one, using flash, is much more stopped down, tinier hole in the lens. So we have much more in focus here. Which one do you prefer? Some days, I can't decide. I just wing it every time. Another thing, always remember that even in the wonderful world of macro, the regular rules of composition still apply. Even with little depth of field, you wanna watch those backgrounds, you wanna keep them clean. Be aware of visual clutter. A couple here, just illustrating visual clutter. Two shots of a mantis, a praying mantis at my house in the backyard. We've got some clutter here. We've got a leaf in the way, a stick, not quite working well, not quite working well. Now look at this. I move a little bit lower, maybe the mantis climbs a little higher, and look, we get a nice, clean shot. Now mantis has moved quite slowly, so you, you really need to have some patience, but this totally changes the background. It's very clean. There's no depth of field here. We're still shooting with a wide open aperture, but it still works because you're back far enough and the head is sharp. It'd be nice if we had a little bit more depth of field, but you still go right to the eyes and this is a fairly successful frame for that. Although it's a very straight picture, not too complicated. By the way, you know the last place I saw a uh, praying mantis, it was, uh, it was at a gas station. It took forever. I think he was waiting for his receipt. I don't know, he wouldn't move. Giant thing, that big. But I digress. Watch that background and use it to your advantage, always. Watch the clutter back there. You can get cluttered backgrounds even in a really shallow depth of field macro world. You can. Be patient and get the composition right. It counts in macro too. Just because you're close on something does not give you a pass or an excuse to shoot junk, okay? So even if it's an abstraction, think about composition always. I do, okay? It's, it's more than okay to experiment with abstract composition in macro work. Just try different things. To me, I love getting in really close on flowers to where you can't even tell what they are because that's different and new and surprising. I do that all the time. I try to anyway. Constantly looking for what I can do to make the world look very, very interesting right in my own backyard all the time. So what are the most common mistakes in macro photography? Well, they are not lighting it and not getting enough depth of field and not getting low enough to really be where the action is. Remember, I wanna get there eye to eye with the turtle or the gecko or the grasshopper, or whatever it is. I wanna be eye to eye with these things, right on top of them, always. Even a fly, if I can do it, even a fly, eye to eye. Now for a lot of things that are moving, an off-camera flash along with a softbox combined with being nimble, really works wonders, it really does. It's just a matter of patience and really working and shooting a lot of pictures. So, your assignment. I want you to shoot one great macro shot at home. 
could be in your driveway or on your sidewalk. I just want you to make one really nice macro shot right where you live. This is an easy one. For extra credit, shoot it with both with supplemental light and without. Shoot it with reflector, flash, flashlight, whatever you decide. I just want you to shoot it with straight ambient and adding light. You know, it could be anything. Could be your dog sleeping. Tight shot of his nose, I don't care. Just do something that's out of the ordinary for you. Push yourself. Do something that is really remarkably seen of a common everyday thing right in your own yard. It's a lot of fun. So our next lecture covers something that used to be the bane of my photographic existence, low light. However, with modern technology, it's become, become one of my favorite situations to shoot in. So make sure you join me, low light. It's excellent. I'll see you then.